Good morning, and welcome to the November 29th service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg, Florida. My name is John Lauder, and I'm a member of this church and also sit on the worship committee. When our minister, Reverend Jack Donovan, is away like he is today, it is the worship committee that often is in charge. Today, you'll see participation from our Religious Education and Communications Coordinator, Janae Johnson, our Music Director, John Arterton, and his husband, James Mack, Caitlin Hammersley and Peter Fritchie, and Carol Ulmer. We will be honoring World AIDS Day, which has been officially held on December 1st, since 1988. We'll also look at some of the similarities to COVID and the lessons that we've learned and those that maybe just need a little bit more work. As a congregation in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, we do not have a creed or required set of beliefs. Instead, we agree to act with reverence towards all things as best we understand, to enhance the well-being of one another and our widening circles of community. We welcome as members and seek community with all people equally, regardless of beliefs, gender, race, nationality, orientation, or background. We become companions for our journeys in our now virtual Sunday service gatherings and in gathering for study, discussion, life sharing, social activities, and social justice. I hope you hear something today that moves you to greater happiness and fulfillment, inspires you to increase caring and understanding, or supports you in your spiritual journey. And now, Caitlin and Peter will light our chalice. Good morning. We're Caitlin Hammersley and Peter Fritchie, and our kids are Mac and Edie, and we're members here at UU St. Pete. We light our chalice, symbolizing our devotion to the light and communion of our community and all living creatures. But in particular, we wish to recognize the 38 million people across the globe living with HIV AIDS, including 1.2 million here in the US. We honor the 32.7 million people who have died of AIDS related complications, of which 700,000 were here in the US. Please join us at home to share the words of our covenant. Love is the spirit, spirit of, of this church and serves its, its law. This is, this is our, our great covenant, covenant to, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love, and to help one another. And now we'll hear the hymn, There is More Love Somewhere, followed by John Motter with some announcements. There is more love somewhere.
Good morning. My name is Janae Johnson, and I'm the Religious Education and Communications Coordinator here at Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg, Florida. How many of you are tired of not being able to do the things that you normally do? You have to do things like wear a mask whenever you go somewhere. Some of you may be going to school, but others may be doing your studies right at home. Many of you aren't able to play with your friends, and you aren't the only one that can't do all the things that you used to. But what if you were the only one in your entire school or even in your entire city that wasn't allowed to go to school? That wouldn't be much fun, would it? Well, today's story is about a real boy who was the only one in his whole city that wasn't allowed to go to school. His name was Ryan White. Ryan had some medical problems growing up. His body just didn't want to do the right thing, so he missed a lot of school. But when he can go, he enjoyed it, and his friends that he had got to see each day just made him feel normal. But when he was 13 years old, he got even sicker. The doctors had to do a lot of tests to find out what was wrong, and the doctors had to tell him some bad news. He had a special disease that was brand new, and the doctors didn't even know much about it. They weren't sure what type of medicine to give him, but at least they knew that he couldn't give it to someone by sneezing or coughing or being on the playground. They just knew that he was very sick. How do you think that made him feel? Probably sad, right? Do you think that he was scared? Yes, he was probably scared, but he knew that he and his friends at school and in the church would support him, so he knew that he would be okay. What do you think his friends at school and church tried to do? Do you think they tried to make him feel better? Send him some get well cards? Do you think they missed him? Yes, of course they probably missed him. But you know what did? They said that they said he couldn't come to school. The parents and children were scared because they were scared they didn't want him anywhere near the children. So Ryan and his mom explained what the doctors had said, but they didn't want to believe them. People gossiped about why he was sick and said mean things that weren't always true. And because some people were not sure what was true and what was false, everyone became even more afraid. It was so bad that Ryan said, people will get up and leave so they won't have to sit anywhere near me. He said that even at church, People would not shake his hand. Now, can you imagine nobody wanted to be around you and saying you couldn't go to school? All he wanted to do was be treated like a regular kid. What would you do if that happened to you? It would be just as hard to be a young boy and have to tell grown-ups that they weren't being fair and they weren't being nice. But Ryan was a brave 13-year-old, and he had a mom and sister that loved him very much. And they were brave, too. So they decided to move to another town where they could start all over. At the new school, Ryan met with the students and the parents and explained what his illness was. He explained that they couldn't catch it from regular things that kids did catch other things. And so the people listened and learned what was true and but Ryan was, was even more special than that. He knew that other people, both kids and adults, were going through the same things that happened to him. And so he got the help from famous people, singers, actors, pro athletes, and even the president met him and became friends with him. So on a day like today, which we call World AIDS Day, we remember people like Ryan and how much they did to help the world heal. He didn't have to do all of that, but he knew how much better it made him feel because he wanted to help other people heal and feel better. Because he was so special, the government created a program. It's called the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program. For 30 years, it has helped people all over the country get the medicine and the help that they need to heal and be healthy. All because he wanted to be a regular kid like everyone else. And now here's John with some announcements. Thank you, Janae, for that Time for All Ages story. Hopefully it prompts some discussion around the dinner table or just brings back some memory of a time that's often forgotten. 
Now for some announcements. There are many virtual and socially distanced events going on at UU St. Pete. They can be found on our website, uusaintpete.org. That's U-U-S-T-P-E-T-E dot -E org. Or in the infinite, which is emailed each Friday evening. Here are just a few to pique your curiosity. Let's bring some pre-holiday cheer to our members and friends during this month's Neighborhood Waving Tour. The date is next Saturday, December 5th. Pick four to six destinations from the directory, stop for a brief masked chat, take a picture or two, and then share your experience during the 7.30 p.m. Zoom chat. If you are a waiver or want to be a wavee, contact Sabine so that we can do our best to not leave someone out. Now there's a continuing creative event with Cynthia Alicia, Alicia, Allison Donovan, and Jill Odinsky. They are helping congregation members document this unusual time with imagery, poetry, and reflections. They are about to launch the fourth journal that they've entitled Embracing Our Masks. And finally, food contributions for the Southside Food Bridge are still being collected. Watch for information regarding the upcoming food and small toy drive. Many of our neighbors are experiencing food insecurities and other economic hardships and could use some helping hands. Now again, for any additional information, especially those important contact emails, check out the infonet or go to the church's website for that information. And next we'll have Carol Ulmer with the first reading of the morning. Good morning, I'm Carol Ulmer and a member of this congregation. Our first reading is comprised of a couple of quotes by Ryan White. You heard the story of Ryan White during Time for All Ages, but I'll finish the story. Ryan died on April 8, 1990 at the age of 18. He would be 49 years old if he were alive today. His mother remains an activist for HIV AIDS. Four months after he died, Congress enacted the Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resources Emergency, or CARE Act, in his honor. It continues to be the payor of last resort for hundreds of thousands of people here in the United States. Following are Ryan's words and thoughts. My family and I held no hatred for those people because we realized they were victims of their own ignorance. AIDS can destroy a family if you let it, but luckily for my sister and me, mom taught us to keep going. Don't give up, be proud of who you are, and never feel sorry for yourself. Wise words for a young man. And now it's time for our offertory. Your generosity to continue the good works of this congregation is appreciated. To keep our congregation thriving, may we remember our connection to one another. And let us not forget our contributions to support the means to those connections. To make a contribution as you listen to our brief offertory, you can hover your cursor or finger over the upper right corner of your screen and click on the I donation button if you're watching on a computer or mobile device. You can also donate by the Give Plus app or on our web page under the Giving tab or by sending a check to the church office. The link to donate is also in the description below. Many thanks. Again, thank you for your contributions that help maintain our physical church, as well as the many programs serving the congregation and the broader community. It's time for joys and concerns. If you are watching the premiere, 
You can type your joy or concern into the chat box at this time, or you can also let Pastor Jack know by Wednesday and they'll be included in next week's service. We have two joys this week. First, it's my pleasure to announce that Beth Stombaugh is our newest member of UU St. Pete. Beth met with Pastor Jack last week at the church to sign the membership book. Beth is a retired special education teacher who came to UUSP through participation in One City Chorus and getting to know John and James. I mean, what do John and James not do? If they're not doing the music, they're out there recruiting new members and introducing them to the church. So that's another joy. But we want to make sure that we welcome Beth and we all look forward to getting to know you, whether it's virtually now or in the future in person. And the second joy is for our very own Pastor Jack and his wife, Allison. They first met at an Interfaith World AIDS Day event in Gainesville, and the rest is history. I'll let him share the details during the coffee hour. Um, this may get the best of me, but just to keep him on his toes, don't forget to ask Allison for her version of events. I want to know who was really wooing who. And that's it for Joys and Concerns, and it'll be back to Carol for our second reading of the day. Now for our second reading. Our second reading of two different quotes comes from the great tennis player, Arthur Ashe. Ashe was the first black player selected to the U.S. Davis Cup tennis team. He is the only black man ever to win the singles title at Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, and the Australian Open. Ashe is believed to have contracted HIV during open heart surgery. He died on February 6, 1993, at the age of 49. President Clinton awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously. The main stadium of the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament is named Arthur Ashe Stadium in his honor. His first words, if I don't ask why me after my victories, I cannot ask why me after my setbacks and disasters. And this second modified quote serves as today's meditation. It's something to think about as we live through the next several months. I wish more of us could understand that our country's increasing isolation, no matter how much it seems to express pride and self-affirmation, is not the answer to our problems. Rather, the answer is a revival of our ancient commitment to God and to the moral and spiritual values which were once legendary in America. We must reach out our hand in friendship, both to those who would befriend us and those who would be our enemy. And now join in singing the song, Seasons of Love, followed by John with the reflection.
I was telling someone about being responsible for the service this weekend and that we are honoring World AIDS Day. They are also HIV positive and they asked me if I felt that dealing with HIV for literally decades made dealing with COVID any easier. It was a good question and one that I had to think about for a few minutes. My answer was not that it made it easier, but I felt that it made me more prepared for the things that have been happening during the pandemic. Honestly, though, how could anyone really be prepared for 12.8 million cases and 262,000 deaths with the numbers still skyrocketing? I have found a lot of similarities between COVID and HIV AIDS, so I guess I'm slightly optimistic that things will get better. I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on the past, nor do I want to be overly focused on COVID but we should at least look at some of the similarities since they are fairly glaring. These were both brand new diseases resulting in great lack of knowledge. The at-risk populations seem to be targeted and centered in urban areas. If you weren't one of the four H's, meaning a hemophiliac, homosexual, Haitian refugee, or heroin user, then you didn't really need to worry about HIV. Likewise, we didn't think that young people got COVID, and if they did, they recovered pretty quickly. The reality is that some people may be at increased risk, but the viruses don't care if you're a Republican or Democrat, a city dweller or a farmer. But these myths have not benefited us. Whether it was Reagan in the 80s or Trump in 2020, the lack of a strong government re response resulted in more suffering and deaths and with both diseases, we see people of color and other marginalized citizens disproportionately affected. 51% of all new HIV cases occur in the South. In fact, Florida is only lower than the District of Columbia and Georgia in terms of rates for new HIV infections. Where is the government response? Well, now's when we can look at some of the brighter side of things. With President-elect Biden, we are getting someone who believes in science, who will listen to the experts, and will tell us the truth. We heard quotes from Ryan White and Arthur Ashe this morning, but how many other people did equally heroic things? It's easy to name some of the big name heroes and allies in the fight against HIV. Magic Johnson, Elizabeth Glazer, Elton John, Rock Hudson, Greg Luganis, and many more. Anthony Fauci and Deborah Birx have been on the front lines for much of the war against HIV, and they are still there for COVID. Fauci caught the ire of activists early on in the epidemic, but over time, he has been recognized as a true pioneer in expanding our knowledge of HIV, Ebola, COVID, and more. Birx was a, army career, a career army officer who ended up retiring as a colonel. She has worked alongside Fauci for many years, and despite some missteps, she's a person that you want in your corner for these battles. But I want to remember a few lesser known heroes. The three, Roy, the three Ray boys from DeSoto County, Florida, battled the school board for a year because they wanted to be able to attend classes. After they won their case, an arsonist destroyed their home. They spoke out in the media, but over time, two of the brothers have died. Randy Ray, though, is still alive and living in Orlando. Bill and I had a roommate, Russ Hall. He 
He worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of the National Capital Area. Part of his job was to terminate health insurance policies when claims related to HIV procedures started to appear. It was easy to claim that it was a pre-existing condition, but before his death, Russ testified before the Maryland House and he helped to get that law changed. But one of the more important groups of people to honor are the activists that fought to get medications fast-tracked for approval by the FDA once they had made it past a certain level of human trials. People knew that they would be dead without effective medication. They knew they didn't have time to wait for years and years for the full testing. So with the choice of death or death, why not allow for emergency approval on the chance that it might provide some life? The benefits did outweigh the costs. Because of them, we now have a mechanism in place that will get at least two COVID vaccines to market in the next several months. Do you have someone you'd like to honor? If so, please take this time to type their name in the chat or say their name out loud. Imagine what they might have done were they to have lived the longer life they deserved but I think to really honor the memory of those who've died of AIDS-related complications, we need to do all that we can to fight for the equal treatment of everyone and not just those of privilege. We have to, to continue to speak out against institutional racism and health and educational disparities that it creates. We should not have African-American women and young black queer men contracting HIV because they happen to live in a state or country that does not prioritize their lives. That also holds true for the people that are providing services to us during the pandemic, stocking grocery shelves, teaching our children, or driving us in an Uber should not be a death sentence. Maybe we should borrow the old chant from ACT UP and make it ACT UP, fight back, fight COVID. Thank you all for coming and joining our service today. I hope you found some meaning in it and we'll see you soon, probably virtually, but we'll see you soon. Sometimes in our lives, we all have pain, we all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow lean on me when you're not strong and i'll be your friend i'll help you carry on for it won't be long till i'm gonna need somebody to lean on if there is a load you have to bear that you can't carry. I'm right up the road. I'll share your load. If you just call me, you just call on me, sister. When you need a hand, we all need somebody to lean on. I just might have a problem that you'll understand. We all need somebody to lean on, lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need somebody to lean on We hope you've enjoyed today's service as we honor World AIDS Day. Hopefully you found some knowledge or information to reflect upon or to gather strength from as we continue to deal with COVID and the uncertainties of a smooth transition of government. The tennis player Arthur Ashe once said, I take the good with the bad and try to face them both with as, with as much calm and dignity as I can muster. We hope to see you at the coffee hour. The information will be shown on the screen and can also be found on Infonet. As I extinguish our chalice, please join us with words reminding us of how we may bring new light to life. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of courage. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world.